Today, Bitcoin reverses course after two days of huge gains. The New York Department of Financial Services clarifies its reasoning for shutting down Signature Bank, and Gilbert Verdian of Quant discusses what's next for crypto banking. Welcome to CNBC's Crypto World, I'm Jordan Smith. Digital currencies reversing course this morning after two days of huge gains. By noon Eastern, Bitcoin fell sharply back to the $24,000 level, while Ether dropped to around $1,600. At the same time, Solana fell to $19. All right, let's talk about the top stories. First, US and German authorities just seized more than $42 million as part of a takedown of crypto mixing service Chipmixer. According to Europol, authorities took down the mixing services infrastructure, seizing four servers, around 2,000 Bitcoin, and seven terabytes of data. Chipmixer was set up in 2017 to obscure transactions on the blockchain, and Europol claims the service was appealing to cyber criminals who used Chipmixer to launder money linked to drugs and weapons trafficking, ransomware attacks, and more. Next, the New York Department of Financial Services is defending its decision to shut down Signature Bank. The state regulator said the closure had nothing to do with crypto and instead was based on a significant crisis of confidence in the bank's leadership. Now that stands in stark contrast with comments from former U.S. Representative Barney Frank, who helped craft the Dodd-Frank banking regulations after the 2008 financial crisis. Frank is also a member of Signature Bank's board, and on Monday he told CNBC that the closure of the bank by regulators was meant to send a quote, very strong anti-crypto message. Now here on Crypto World, we're talking to all kinds of experts about what this means for crypto banking. And Kavita Gupta of the Delta Blockchain Fund says companies may have to move to stable coins because traditional banks may not be ready to take in former customers of Signature and Silvergate. Now these companies have to create a new bank account at traditional banks like Bank of America or JP Morgan or other places, which are not that crypto friendly. Even if you are moving within US, a KYC account, Silvergate, USD into USD to a traditional bank system, but your company has some token somewhere associated online, these guys are not giving you KYC very fast to open your bank account. So that's creating this really interesting and sad problem which like literally I joked about on Twitter I'm like okay so when we were investing and we have been investing into US uh, KYC companies and they would give us an option of sending bank wires versus stable coins we have always gone for bank wire thinking okay this is another level of KYC on the banks now we are like dude why don't you have more stable coins why are you with regulated companies because they are stuck. Even if they are ready to move multi-million dollars, they don't have a place to move multi-million dollars today. All right, we're sticking with the topic of Signature, Silvergate, and the future of crypto banking for our main story. I spoke to Gilbert Verdian, the CEO of Quant, about what the closure of the Send Network and Signet means for cryptocurrencies and when a new banking partner might come along. So I think when a lot of people are talking about Signature and Silvergate and its involvement with crypto, they're worried about how it will limit crypto's interaction with traditional banking going forward. But can you talk about how enmeshed crypto is with traditional finance as it stands right now, even before the collapse of Silvergate and uh, Signature? I think uh, crypto as a, as a technology has been around since uh, 2008. I know my time in the government at the Treasury at the time, we were very early to look at it. So, that, so regulators have had many years to assess crypto and banks like SVB uh, and Silvergate and, and others are kind of innovators in this space. They, they took on um, a crypto challenge to understand what it can do and then offer that back as a service to consumers, businesses and, and institutions. So, you know, for what has happened, and I think it's kind of an, an evolution of maturity within the financial system. The early innovators are doing their thing and, and, and they've tried it out. And unfortunately, this hasn't really worked in, in everyone's favor. And, and what we're seeing in the markets this week is kind of a, a fear. And, and one of our board members, uh, Guy Dietrich, says fear happens very fast and, uh, and it spreads very fast. So, so we're seeing that um, happen very quickly within the markets, but it's, it's not going away. What, what we can actually learn from the experiment of decentralization, the experiment of crypto is how to do it by regulated institutions and how to offer it as a, as a new form of an instrument or a new form of a, 
of a tokenized security. And, and that's where we're heading. Yeah. You mentioned the fear, and obviously we're seeing it with regional banks, but particularly with crypto, how big of a risk is a crypto contagion event? How big of a risk is that spilling into traditional markets? And has that been tamed now that the government's stepped in and backstopped some of these deposits? Um, if, you, if you look at contagion and, and resilience and systemic risk, uh, this is a small drop in the ocean, what's happening this week. Uh, the actual um, value of what's happening is, is only 300 billion, and the US banking system is $23 trillion worth. So it's not a real contagion to the same uh, effect as we had during the real financial crisis, the, the GFC in 2008. Uh, so the contagion has, has been quite successful because government overnight has stepped in. We saw the same thing happen in the UK with uh, HSBC agreeing to buy uh, SVB Bank. Uh, and that's been a, a very strong move for the markets and, and it's rallying and reacting to that. Um, but if you think about contagion, we're, we're not risking the system as a whole. But if you look at crypto as, as an asset class, less than 10 years ago, uh, in, you know, in 2013, it was only 10 billion worth. Uh, today, it's over a trillion. So the, the actual market of, of that new type of asset ha has become too big to not do anything about and too big to not regulate. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing regulators understand what, it, what can happen to a market and to the rest of the system, and they're starting to regulate appropriately uh, you know, moving forward. Mm -hmm. Speaking about regulation, um, I'm wondering if you could give sort of a reality check um, as to, you know, there's been a lot of concern around whether this the, the shutdown of FCEN and Signet um, will really limit cryptocurrency companies and their ability to transact with U.S. dollars. Um, do you see a competitor coming along? Do you see any headwinds when it comes to uh, regulation and another bank stepping up? Um, what, what does the landscape look like now that we've lost these two forms of technology? I think what we'll firstly see is, and what the market needs is clear guidance from regulators on, on what is allowed, what is appropriate and what is expected. Uh, that will be coming in and, and we've seen introductions of new bills in Europe that, that are facilitating that and we're seeing MICA and, and the financial markets bill in the UK. Um, what we're going to see next is the actual implementation of new types of assets, new types of instruments that use crypto technology like blockchain tokenization, fractionalization to deliver better products and services back to consumers, businesses and institutions. So we've already seen the beginning of that. And, and a lot of the, the, the global banks have been experimenting with this. JP Morgan, Citi with the regulated liability network and, and others uh, are bringing and introducing new forms of uh, instrument classes and assets to the market and it's using the technology um, available from blockchain uh, and, and learning from what, what's happened within DeFi systems and, and DeFi networks to, to have a regulated entity deliver that, that product and that service to, to the wider market. Yeah, and regulation will take some time. So I'm curious if people don't want to wait for that regulatory clarity, it seems like stable coins are the next uh, option there. What's the out outlook for stable coin regulation or the use of stable coins in, in, instead of banking? Um, given all the, the drama with USDC and some of the other stable coins this past weekend? Um, we don't believe there's um, much hope for, for unregulated stable coins moving forward. What we're seeing is that transition of a new form of money. And traditional money has been very binary. It's, it's a buy or a sell. It's a push or a pull. And what we're seeing is using the technology available today is tokenized money in, in new forms and, and in new formats, such as a central bank digital currency, or even tokenized deposits, tokenized liabilities, and these are issued by commercial banks. So we're gonna see a new form of digital money that is programmable, it's able to roam, so your bank account can be used anywhere in the world, similar to the way cards work today, and similar to the way your mobile phone can be used anywhere in the world. Um, and that's going to be a safer choice for consumers and businesses because it's backed by central banks, uh, it's regulated, it's insured, it, it's, it's the same, currency as you use your, your normal currency, but it's it's got more features and more, more functions. So we'll see a whole bunch of products being developed out of programmable money. And the first will be commercially issued stable coins um, or tokenized deposits, uh, followed by central bank digital currencies. All right, that's all for Crypto World today, but we'll be back again tomorrow and we'll see you then.